Hello, my name is Max Engels. I'm the CEO and headmaster of 42 Wolfsburg. 42 Wolfsburg is probably one of the most progressive higher education ventures for software engineering. And we are 100% based on peer learning and we are tuition free. You're about to watch a fireside chat with Vin Cerf, one of the fathers of the internet. And we hope you enjoy the event. And if you're curious, check out 42wolfsburg.de. Win, welcome to 42 Wolfsburg. We're so glad to have you. It's freut mich sehr, Max. Thank you, Schön, for your time. So, um, Win spent a little bit um, of time um, in southern Germany. So, um, watch out what you're saying on chat or uh, to him in <laughs> German. Uh, of course, we, we want to um, share some. Um, some topics and um, start a conversation in a moment, but uh, please do also feel invited to think about questions that you have for Wind as uh, we will open it up to everybody in um, a later part of this session. So um, as we agreed, Wind, I um, will embarrass you a little bit in the very beginning to um, show a slide about your background and uh, you're more than welcome to comment on that or not. So um, <laughs> who is Vint? Well, um, uh, you will best find out by listening to him, of course, and asking him questions. But um, he's uh, very well known for his work that, um, uh, well, didn't start, but actually brought um, uh, the fruits of TCP IP, the open protocol, that um, he developed to back together with Bob Kahn. And while I think it's incredibly interesting to uh, listen to the story and to understand how that came about and that as you, know, you can all hardly imagine, um, it wasn't clear that TCP IP would actually create the internet and that um, this was such a good idea in the moment. Um, it was uh, certainly a battle of protocols and of standards to, to do networking, but it turned out that giving um, TCP IP as a, uh, if you want, as a gift to the world without any proprietary uh, constellations and really building what is now known as the open internet and the open standards that uh, make up the open internet was um, the beginning of the long ride of Vint becoming one of the fathers of the internet. Uh, significantly later, if you think about it, uh, 20 years later in uh, 92, Vint um, and his colleagues decided to found ISOC, the Internet Society, which is really the organization that um, this decides or steers the way the internet is developing through organizations, sub-organizations like the Internet Engineering Task Force or the Internet Architecture Board. Uh, those are really, really amazingly open institutions, open organizations. Vint, uh, I'd, I'd love to um, uh, hear you know, how you manage to keep them this open and effective at the same time, because uh, that seems to be a, a real um, part of the secret mix that made the internet as successful as it is. And then in 2005, Vint uh, joined Google. If I remember correctly, um, uh, you and Eric Schmidt had a, a pretty good connection and uh, he brought you on to basically promote this still fairly um, new environment and a new company, Google and the search that um, runs it. And uh, Vint and I actually met around 2006 and um, have worked ever since on topics around internet governance. And um, you see on the right here some uh, pictures of um, Bint when he was um, closer to most of your ages. Um, uh, the, the middle Bint could also play uh, James Bond without a problem, I would uh, argue. And um, the Vint picture on the right uh, shows that he has a prankster in him as his generation is uh, quoted not only for inventing um, the internet, but also the counterculture and that very liberal and um, you know, positive social um, drive, the freedom of expression aspects that are all inherent in the internet. 
And um, on the, the bottom, I couldn't resist to uh, include a picture from uh, the team that uh, Vint and I worked in, or I worked in, Vint uh, still is, of course, at Google. Um, at Google, when we participated in the United Nations Internet Governance Forum in Berlin in uh, November 2019. That was a, a really wonderful moment. And I think the last time the two of us had uh, a good glass of wine together and some serious work. Is that right, Vint? I think that's right. Uh, we haven't seen each other in well over a year. Uh, it's, uh, I haven't seen anybody <laughs> except online. Uh, so I'm looking forward to uh, the end of 2021 when I hope we will have all recovered largely from the pandemic. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, we'll just have to learn how to have virtual uh, celebrations. <laughs> That's the optimistic um, Vint, I know. Uh, I'm sure you um, are many times in uh, the situation that you know, you're introduced and you think, gosh, um, I wish you would have said something completely different. Is there anything that um, uh, I should have mentioned that I forgot that you want to correct or um, where you want to add a little bit more color on um, the background that uh, you have? Well, as you, you, that was a very lengthy introduction. Thank you very much for that. Uh, for anybody who really wants to see more, just go Google Vince Surf and you'll find me in Wikipedia. And it's not too uh, incorrect. It's uh, Most of it is, uh, is correct. So uh, that's one way. Uh, let's see, what shall I tell you? Well, uh, one thing uh, to say is that I grew up in Southern California and I went to a high school called Van Nuys High, which is north of Los Angeles. Um, and that school turned out to be sort of part of a bedroom community for Hollywood. And so the other people who went to Van Nuys High School included people like Marilyn Monroe and uh, Robert Redford and uh, Don Drysdale, a, a baseball player. Uh, the uh, former head of the Smithsonian was there. Um, and ironically, three people who were very key to the development of the internet also went to Van Nuys High. I was there, my best friend there, Stephen Crocker, and still my best friend, was there, and Jonathan Postel. John Postel was also there at high school. At the same high school, we were not in the same classes, we were just one class apart. Um, but we reconvened uh, by pure happenstance at UCLA in the uh, late 1960s and become, became involved in the ARPANET development, which was a predecessor to the internet around 1968 or 69. Uh, and uh, that sort of cemented uh, a relationship which lasted, has lasted literally uh, all this time. Sadly, uh, John Postel passed away in 1998. He had been responsible for managing the requests for comments, which are the documents that uh, uh, describe in detail the technology, both of the ARPANET and then the internet. He also managed the domain name system and internet address allocation all by himself until of course it became impossible for one person to do that. And now a whole organization called the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers was created in order to manage the IP address space and the domain name systems. Uh, and separately, the Internet Society, which Max uh, mentioned before, was uh, created in 90, 1992 to house the Internet Engineering Task Force, the Internet Architecture Board, and the Internet Research Task Force which had uh, existence before I came or before the Internet Society, but uh, needed uh, a nonprofit framework to support their work. It costs about six million a year now to run the IETF. And just to come back to uh, Max's observation about the openness of the IETF, it's a very interesting group. There is no way to join the Internet Engineering Task Force. There's no uh, membership uh, requirement. You just have to show up. And that informality turns out to be a very powerful tool, and it works in a lot of other contexts as well. So perhaps one takeaway from today's interaction is to keep in mind that sometimes informality is your friend. To give you an example from the network security space, uh, there is a uh, piece of malware called the Configure Worm. It's been around for, I'm guessing, maybe as much as 20 years, certainly 15. Uh, it isn't clear where it came from. Uh, so far as I know, it hasn't done any damage uh, and people have been able to identify it and presumably eradicate some of it. Uh, but the, uh, when it was discovered, 
there was a lot of concern about what might be done with this piece of malware. And so an informal configure working group was created. And the informality meant that you didn't have a set of rules that determine who could or could not contribute to analyzing and uh, perhaps uh, defending against this thing. And so we had hackers who showed up. We had people from the Defense Department. We had people from uh, Europe uh, and other places all participating in this informal working group. And the informality made it possible to bring them together without a lot of uh, somebody checking off a list of things and denying access to someone who didn't meet some criteria. So informality may turn out to be a very important tool. You should keep that in mind, uh, I think, as you pursue your own careers that sometimes um, doing something with a lot of rules in it boxes you in and keeps you from, uh, from doing something that's more successful. So I think that's that's more than enough, uh, Max. Why don't we move in now to whatever questions you might have? And then of course, I'm interested in questions from your students as well. Very cool. And uh, indeed, you know, the, the secret um, formula of um, keeping it informal, um, but also inclusive, but also um, effective is uh, what we're seeking at 42 as well. So very um, spot on. Okay, let's move to the two parts of the conversation that um, we're going to have a bit in, um, on, on stage if you want, and then uh, we can open it up. The two parts are for um, the community. One, Vint recommended uh, uh, some books for you um, for our manual of uh, happy software engineers. <clears throat> So we're planning to have a library here at 42 Wolfsburg, yes, with real books, but obviously we're not gonna get just any books. We're gonna um, uh, look for recommendations from people like Vint and other thought leaders and researchers and so on to recommend us what a happy software engineer should read and learn about. So um, not necessarily um, the most, um, the newest, training for Java in 21 days or anything that, um, you know, is outdated in a year, but the books that um, are interesting still in 10 years and 20 years, maybe much, much longer. So we're gathering books for um, uh, and tips for that library and Vint has given us a first set that we should definitely include. And um, Vint, the questions are going to be very simple. Why should anybody read this book if they want to get become good software engineers? And of course, you're more than welcome to spice it up with any um, personal anecdotes. Well, of course, the obvious answer is that the answer to everything is 42 for a lot of you who may have read the uh, restaurant at the end of the galaxy. Uh, you know, so long and thanks for all the fish. Uh, Doug Adams was uh, an acquaintance. I don't want to overstate the relationship, but uh, I had great respect for him. Although after I finished reading his books, and uh, some of you may know, it was I think it was a radio program or maybe even a television program for a while. Um, but uh, I thought he must be quite a, a bizarre character. Um, and after I read his books anyway, and especially Vogon poetry and things like that. But by sheer happenstance, I um, had to, uh, I was invited to go to a conference in London where, uh, where Doug uh, was speaking. And uh, because of my schedule, the, um, the uh, host of the meeting decided that the only way that we could fit it into my calendar was to go by way of the Concorde. So I had the chance to fly back and forth across the Atlantic on the Concorde. And when I landed in the afternoon, I was there just in time to run to the uh, uh, to the bar uh, to meet with some of the other guests. And there is this big tall guy with his name tag on it said Doug Adams. So I went over to him and I said, um, are you the Doug Adams that wrote Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? And he said, yes. And I said, wow, I've always wanted to meet you. And he looked at my name tag and it said Vince Cerf. And he said, are you the Vince Cerf that invented the internet? And I said, yeah. And he said, wow, I've always wanted to meet you. <laughs> so we shook hands and went off and spent several hours together just wow. chatting. He turns out to have been a very thoughtful guy. He was fascinated by technology and science, history. Uh, he was a good friend of Richard Dawkins, whom some of you might know has written a number of books on genetics and is sort of a, a strong proponent of Darwinism. Uh, on sadly, uh, 
uh, Doug Adams died uh, in, in uh, California, we had arranged for him to go to Vandenberg Air Force Base to watch a space launch. And he had a heart attack, I think, before the launch to, uh, happened and passed away. So uh, I really miss him. But he's left us this wonderful legacy of zany ideas. And the reason I think that it's the school name, of course, is, is a play on that. But it's important uh, to keep in mind that thinking outside of the box, uh, being comfortable with ideas that are not accepted uh, by uh, the, you know, the general public or by the scientific community is often uh, a path towards uh, new breakthrough thinking. And so uh, Doug is one of those guys who encouraged that. And I think we should remember him for that and take advantage of it while you're at, uh, at the 42 school. Thank you, Vin. What a story. Get ready for the next book. James Gleick, Chaos. Is there chaos in the universe? Vin, yeah. why should um, happy software engineers read this book? There's, well, first of all, James is, is a very clear writer. Uh, he's not a mathematician by trade, but, um, but he is very good at explaining the concept behind chaos. Uh, what, what he's telling us is several things. First of all, he's telling us that there are patterns to what, are otherwise, uh, what otherwise looks like a chaotic process. Great attractors are an example of a term that pops up in his book. The reason that that's important is that there are a lot of systems that uh, have chaotic appearance, but they actually, uh, that chaos is um, expressed in a predictable way. Uh, you pre imagine for a moment if you've seen um, a, uh, an hourglass, for example, filled with sand. And when you turn it, the sand starts to drop down and a little pyramid starts building up. And at some point, you know, the py pyramid just keeps growing smoothly and the sides are all nice and smooth. And then all of a sudden it collapses. That's an example of the chaotic uh, result. Uh, there are also some orbital patterns that you can see that become chaotic uh, from time to time because of multiple um, objects being in, in uh, concurrent orbits. So the chaos turns out to be something we should understand because a lot of very simple systems may have chaotic properties. And so if you're designing a very complex computing system, especially one which is distributed and involves large numbers of systems interacting, doesn't that sound like the internet? Uh, you can have these kinds of chaotic uh, results. And to the extent that you are able to uh, prepare for a chaotic event, you may be able to tamp down some of the, the side effects of those things. So understanding how those phenomena arise and recognizing them uh, is a very valuable capability. And so I, that's why I recommended that book. Very much agree. Uh, one of the fun things about uh, chaos theory and the history of it is that it got rebranded. Um, that uh, after a while they, they kind of asked around and people said, I don't want to have anything to do with chaos. So now it's called complexity sciences, which sounds much more, uh, you know, acceptable, I guess, to modern managers and people who have to uh, take it up. But uh, really a, a fundamental uh, book that, um, you know, describes the uh, switch from a Newtonian worldview to a um, much more uh, dynamic and unclear worldview. Um, uh, thanks for that recommendation. Let's go to the next one, which is um, the science of the artificial. Hey, this, uh, this comes from Herb Simon, who uh, won the Turing Award, which is a, a very big deal in the computer community, as I hope many of you know. Uh, Herb also got the Nobel Prize uh, for economics. The reason this is so important is that what you and I do uh, in the space of computing is, in fact, a highly artificial process. Uh, software is an artifact. Computers are artifacts. The way they operate uh, is artifact and uh, the virtual space in which they function uh, is a pure artifact of human invention. Understanding um, the the um, the concept that we have that we create things that are not necessarily predictable, 
which again gets back to the, the chaos uh, book as well, uh, is very important because uh, people are relying on the software that you and I write. And if we are um, not aware of the uh, potential hazards that mistakes we make will visit on other people, uh, if we haven't thought through things in a system level way, which is what Simon is urging, uh, then we may fail to recognize when uh, some artifact that we've created uh, is going to behave in a way which is harmful or at least unexpected. And so once again, this kind of book uh, pushes you into system level thinking instead of being focused solely on a small piece of software, a little part of a of a library or a computation of a function. If you're thinking about more uh, large scale and complex systems, this is the kind of thinking that you want to adopt. And that's why I think Simon's book is another one worth your time to read. It's an old book, it's been around for a long time, but it's still very uh, relevant to uh, the kinds of things that we see today. Indeed, here came up with um, uh, things like information overload um, uh, as well. I mean, a, a polyglot scholar of various disciplines that um, I can only highly recommend too. All right, let's go to the next one um, where uh, again, you have chosen a book that is um, has been around for a while and um, played you know, a role in how teaching and learning math and solving problems has developed over time. Give us so, some context for that book then, please. So Polia, uh, I met Polia when I was at Stanford as an undergraduate back in the 60s. And, uh, and you'll notice, by the way, that the uh, foreword is by John Conway. John passed away recently, but he was uh, well known for his invention of something called the game of life, uh, which involved very, very simple rules, which when executed, created extremely complex behaviors. So once you can see the theme that's, that's running in all of these books is the recognition that simple rules can produce very complex looking uh, results and understanding that and understanding the simplicity that generated it helps you analyze what might otherwise be on an overwhelmingly complex system or situation. And Polia in the How to Solve It book teaches you how to analyze problems, how to break them down, uh, how to recognize uh, perhaps solutions of portions of the problem and then put them back together into a whole solution. This kind of analytical thinking, of course, is fundamental to programming. And it's one of the reasons that I think everyone should be exposed to writing software. And I really don't care what the language is. You know, it could be Go, it could be Scratch, it could be Squeak, it could be um, you know, Python or you know, any or C++ or any of the other popular languages. The reason I think everyone should be exposed to that is that it forces you to think in logical terms. It often forces you to take a problem and break it down into parts so that you can solve each of the various parts like writing various pieces of, the, of a piece of software and then put it all back together again. Uh, that analytical and logical thinking uh, is very important. The other reason the experience is so important is that uh, you learn very, very rapidly that uh, when you write a piece of software, it doesn't always work the way you expected it to. The, the thing that attracted me to programming uh, when I was in a teenager, uh, you have to understand I was a teenager in the previous century around 1960 or so. I was uh, I was 17 by the time I had a chance to actually write any software, um, and I I was first mesmerized by the idea that you could create your own universe and it would do what you told it to do. And I thought that was just the ultimate in you know creative opportunity. Then I discovered that what these software programs did is what you told them to do, not necessarily what you expected them to do or what you wanted them to do. And the difference between what you wanted them to do and what you told it to do is called a bug. And the thing that I found very important and I continue to believe is important is people should discover how easy it is to make mistakes and how hard it is to figure them out. And that means that we should, everyone who has this exposure will learn to be a little suspicious of software because they know that programmers who write the software may have made mistakes. So we should anticipate and, and, and be prepared for software that we rely on not to work the way we expected it to. 
so uh, my sense anyway is that uh, learning to write software uh, is a, a, an experience that you can apply to almost any situation. And it also um, immerses you in the scientific method. So keep in mind how that works. Uh, you may have a hypothesis uh, and you create an experiment in order to test the hypothesis. And one possibility, of course, is that the experiment produces exactly the result that you expect. Um, and, and so, of course, that, that leaves you thinking your theory must be very good. Then there's the possibility that, you know, the curve that you predict is absolutely perfect, except for this one data point over here. Now, there's two kinds of scientists. One, one of them will say, oh, it must be measurement error and ignores that. The other scientist looks at that odd result and says, hmm, that's funny. He's the one that gets the Nobel Prize when he figures out what that data point was all about. So uh, scientific thinking is very important. It's applicable to all kinds of other walks of life. And that's why I think everyone should be exposed to these kinds of ideas because they're so applicable in such a broad range of, of, uh, of careers. Awesome. Then allow me to um, recall for a moment for the students uh, what happened when um, we first chatted about uh, 42 and I explained that there is no professors and that the students are all learning just by actually tackling programming uh, challenges and things like that. Uh, what Vin said was like, oh, so it's like the early um, days of the World Wide Web when everybody was just clicking on show source and, you know, copying each other and learning from actually, um, you know, looking at the source codes and playing around with it. Um, could you elaborate for a moment on um, why you think this curiosity-based approach might be um, at least equally relevant and useful than the more classic uh, university and school style pedagogy. So um, I'm not going to make the argument that all learning should be uh, this sort of experiential thing, because sometimes uh, an organized presentation of something giving you conceptual uh, frameworks can be very helpful. But if you're trying to learn a skill, uh, there's no substitute for actually trying to do something. And especially if it doesn't work, because that's where you learn something. Uh, because if it doesn't work and you figure out why, that usually teaches you not to make that mistake again. Uh, when you look at the HTML, for example, which is what people were seeing when the World Wide Web was first coming up, the browsers allowed you to show how the HTML worked. So people could copy from each other. And then as uh, Max says, they could experiment with changes to it. Uh, I remember doing something like that with uh, my older son who uh, was uh, practicing Python programming. And we decided to write a little piece of software that produced some complex displays. And then we would trade the software back and forth and make little tweaks to try to outdo the other on some complexity of the result. So uh, this experience of trying to do something uh, really teaches you better than almost anything I can think of. But let me give you uh, a kind of a counterexample to this in, from my own experience. After I finished my undergraduate work at Stanford in mathematics, I had taken as many computer courses as I could. And then I went to work for IBM. Now, this is mid-1965, and I was running a time-sharing system called QuickTran, which let people write pro uh, Fortran programs remotely. This is 1965. Time-sharing had only been invented around 1961 or 62. So this was wonderful for me uh, in terms of you know, career because I got to get my hands dirty with a concept that was fairly new, time-sharing. Now, of course, it's the norm. Uh, and I was down in the guts of the program. It was all written in assembly language. Uh, I would, I'd start with what happens when somebody types a key on the terminal and you know the signal goes into a, a signal processor and it gets absorbed into the computer, turned into a character. And you know, so I would read through the program to watch where the, you know, where does the character go after it's been typed? And I learned how the operating system worked well enough to uh, fix uh, some of the bugs that I found. Um, after two years, though, I realized that while I had this detailed knowledge of that particular program, what I didn't have was much of a concept of what's operating system design all 
about how do you design programming languages? You know, what's an LR2 grammar? And I decided if I was going to make any real progress in my career in computing, which I had settled on as, as a path that I liked, I needed to go back to school. So I went to UCLA, enrolled in the PhD program, and started taking classes in operating systems, data structures, language uh, design. Um, and then I fell into the ARPANET project which is all about networking. And I never extracted myself from that. So my entire career has been the result of being trapped at UCLA and networking, uh, not that I've regretted it. So, uh, but the important thing is that I felt the need to go back, but it was as a result of having two years of experience in the real world, recognizing that I didn't have the framework that I needed to think about all these things in a more coherent way. So I'm hoping all of you who are in school now are motivated by the, the desire and the need to have that framework, which upon which is all the detailed stuff that you're working on, but the framework helps you organize it and to think about it and maybe even create new concepts that other people can take advantage of. Thank you, Wind. I think that really made the point that um, I certainly hear from a lot of colleagues when I tell them about 42 is like practice is great, but what about the metacognition? What about the modeling and the analysis? And I do think that um, you know they they don't uh, come in separate pieces. It's actually you know when you do one, you all also need the other. And uh, so uh, complementing the practice with things like the library books that you recommend and others recommend will hopefully lead to that. We have one more book and then we're moving to some uh, programming paradigms and their uh, fate in history. So stay tuned for that. Um, but first here is the last book yeah. you recommend. I admit, I did not know this one. It might be due to the fact that it was first um, published in 1962, but um, I, Dear students, um, it is still under development and might be one of the most comprehensive um, programming guides possible. And uh, that one won't get outdated too soon because it's, it really has the, the grounds. Then why did you recommend us this one? So Don Knuth is a dear friend. Uh, I met him in 1965 when I was an undergraduate. He was a professor at Stanford. And of course, I returned to Stanford University and joined the faculty in 1972 and knew him in a collegial way. And we are still colleagues. Um, Don is probably one of the smartest people I have ever met. He is the ultra uh, analytic person. And he's not afraid of extremely hard work. He's also uh, very talented. He builds and plays organs, for example. He constructed his own organ and put it in his house and he plays beautifully. Uh, along with another person like that is Alan Kay, by the way, who invented the small talk language and then squeak. He also is, a, is an organist and built his own organ and, and built a wing of the house to house it. So, that, you know, music and mathematics and computer science often come together. So Don, uh, in fact, is, uh, is, is the ultimate perfectionist. I mean, I, 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 some of his students were uh, uh, my students as well. And uh, one, at least a couple of them did their dissertations under Don Knuth. And it was, it was hard because Don insisted on absolute precision and, you know, and, and exact analysis. One day when uh, he was trying to write a paper for publication uh, and he was using, I don't know what word processing system, but whatever it was, he wasn't happy with it. And so he went off and invented something called tech, which is spelled T-E-X, but pronounced tech. And there is a variation on it called law tech. Uh, this thing included scalable fonts. So he invented his own fonts to have the property that when you blew up the number of pixels that the text occupied, that it still looked good, uh, which is what does not happen uh, with a lot of fonts where you blow them up and then they, they become oddly uh, distorted, sort of like trying to 
blow uh, a, a dog up to the size of an elephant without changing the ratios of the legs and the to the body and everything and it collapses of its own weight so so knuth analyzes data structures and algorithms in with great precision and great energy in those books and they are classic i mean this is absolutely classic and well worth having on your bookshelf and well worth spending time reading because if you're looking for depth of thought this book is the is sort of the gold standard in my opinion wow Vin, wonderful you just inspired a bunch of students to start to create their own instruments build organs in our fab lab and uh, similar endeavors so um well done and um we'll certainly get a a nice copy of the book. Now um, we have we moved to the second part of our conversation, which is about uh, programming paradigms. And uh, I've alerted to this a little bit earlier when I said, "Well, back when you invented TCP/IP, it wasn't clear that that would become such a world standard." You know, there were other contestants who um, might have worked just um, as well, or at least similar. Uh, there is the famous example of uh, the video cassette uh, standard Betamax and VHS, where you know many people argue Betamax was probably the better system, but because of dynamics in the world, it never uh, turned out to um, uh, to be the successful one. And um, so, I recently watched a presentation by a colleague um, Brett Victor who yeah. um, uh, is a very creative thinker, used to be a software engineer at Apple, now runs his own um, think tank, research tank in um, next to Berkeley in Oakland. And he's basically arguing that there are a number of programming paradigms that we use right now that you know might serve us well sometime more into the future, some might be um, outdated very soon and we come up with new paradigms. So I'd like to um, confront you with a couple of those and uh, you're welcome to comment on the ones that um, you uh, want to comment on. Here is the concept in Brad's word. The, the most dangerous thought that you can have as a creative person is to think that you know what you're doing. I think that's beautiful just by itself. Because once you think you know what you're doing, you stop looking around for other ways of doing things and you stop being able to see other ways of doing things. You become blind. And along those lines, I want to um, uh, share with the students and remind you that some of these paradigms, you know, the way that the World Wide Web and the internet are working now are not, uh, that wasn't clear as mentioned earlier. This is a paper uh, or a, a proposal, I would almost say, from 1988, so long before Netscape, long before uh, the, the World Wide Web, Web took off, where um, Bob Kahn and you proposed an architecture for a digital library system that, um, you know, it's an amazing report I recommend for everybody to have a look, but it uh, it's also a good example of um, this um, uh, competition of ideas and what comes up is not necessarily the only way to do things. And um, here are some of the, the programming paradigms that I think uh, are being discussed right now and that um, you may or may not uh, have an opinion about whether they have a future, whether um, you know, th there's um, more to be discovered here. So one aspect is certainly APIs, the way that uh, different programs exchange data and um, you know, interface with each other. Right now, those APIs have to de be defined quite specifically and um, there are um, ideas and arguments that APIs become much more agile and find um, uh, each other and find the way to talk to each other. Uh, fascinating environment. I'm sure uh, on the second one, you um, went through a variety of um, programming, how to say, uh, processes over the years. There is, of course, the famous waterfall method. There is agile, there is extreme, 
And uh, you know, what is your um, sense, your perspective on um, how to develop programs in a, in a dynamic, effective, efficient way? Then the third one is visual programming. I took an example from scratch here on the side. Uh, this is not a program that my nine-year-old put together, but um, he is programming with nine years in such an environment. So it certainly opens up um, the, the trade to much younger and it, um, people and it lowers the barrier to entry. Quite interesting. And then uh, last, but certainly not least, there is a really fundamental um, difference between how you engineer, how you architect and plan software in the traditional way, and how you develop machine learning models and uh, bring those to bear and to use. Um, in the interest of time, I've um, combined them all and I let you choose um, which ones to comment on so we have some more time Oh, it's from the students. Well, that, uh, you, you lumped an awful lot of stuff together, like six major uh, points, including the nobots. Uh, let me just comment on the on the li digital library idea. Uh, in the course of thinking our way through what digital libraries would be like, uh, we imagined that they contained a vast quantity of digital objects, which were not just textbooks, but they were anything that was digital uh, that could be digitized. It could be video. It could be you know, web pages hadn't been invented at that point, but it could be anything that's digitizable. Um, and then we and we said, well, imagine that we have this, now the internet existed at that point. It'd been running for five years because we turned it on in 1983. And so we were thinking, okay, imagine we have this vast array of computers and some of them have content that might be of interest to others. How would you find it? And because the, uh, the World Wide Web didn't exist and certainly search engines didn't exist, we kind of explored that concept by imagining that you could launch programs into the internet and they would go to places that you directed them to. And when they landed, when those programs, there's a piece of software which, which we would transmit through the net to a target when that piece of software landed, there would be some standard interactions that it could do with the host computer that it landed on. And we imagined that it would have a running program we called the concierge. The concierge would respond to the arriving nobot by telling it what facilities were available at that machine. Here's, you know, here's the kind of information that's available. Here's the kind of questions you can ask. Uh, and here's the format in which you could ask them. Uh, we imagined that these pieces of software had the ability to clone themselves. So if you need, if you discovered at one destination that you needed to go to a dozen other places, you'd simply clone uh, a dozen more copies of yourself and they would go off. And the idea was that they would be pro you know, propagated around in the network and they'd come back together again uh, and tell you what the answer was. So we invented this entire you know, fictitious universe of, uh, of systems that behave that way. Ironically, looking back on that from the World Wide Web point of view, uh, there are some similarities. For example, your browser, when it goes to a website, ingests a piece of software called a web page and it interprets it. Now, the mechanisms are not quite the same, and there isn't anything called a concierge that I'm aware of. But the idea of mobile software is clearly instantiated in this. It didn't start out quite that way because the uh, browsers of the, of the earliest days just were uh, formatters, basically. It would pull an HTML web page up and display it on the screen. But after a while, we started interpreting what was coming in uh, for more than just uh, formatting purposes. Now, coming to some of the other topics that, um, that Max put up, um, let me say that a the API space uh, is the dual of protocol space. So the API spaces tell you how you interact with another piece of code locally. So how do I get into make system calls in an operating system? How do I invoke another piece of software? What parameters do I need to pass? What information do I get back? One of the things you learn very early on, or at least should learn, is that information hiding is actually not a bad idea. Global variables in a program are the worst possible choice, generally speaking, because some random program affects a global variable and has no idea what other software is depending on that and things get all messed up. So con con uh, constraining 
the um, uh, effect of uh, variables is often valuable. And that's what information hiding is about. The flip side is protocols. Protocols are the sort where you don't know who, what the other guy did. All you know is that whatever that other guy did needs to conform to whatever the message exchange and procedures and state machines uh, that the protocol requires. That's what the internet is all about. It's all about shared protocols implemented independently, but interacting in a predictable, uh, theoretically predictable way. Um, gosh, uh, I'm just thinking <laughs> about all those, all those other uh, lists of things. Oh, okay. So visual programming languages, I think are very helpful uh, to introduce someone to program thinking because it hides a lot of the messy detail of, uh, of a typical text programming language. You know, I don't know about you, but if you're exposed to a new application of some kind and it has a lot of functionality, it's hard to figure out what's important and what isn't to you. You know, how am I, I've got this machine and it's got 7,000 levers on it and I don't know which of the four levers I'm gonna use the most. And so now I'm stuck with 7,000 things trying to figure out what's important. I can't remember them all. The visual programming languages help you reduce that level of, uh, of complexity so that you can learn the important functional and conceptual pieces. Then of course, as time goes on, you want more control and more precision uh, out of what you can express. And that leads you to other uh, more elaborate programming languages. Uh, just one comment about Brett uh, Victor's work. Um, one of the things that Brett is very good at is creating programming languages that uh, produce visual results. And so his, uh, his big thing is that when you're writing a program which has a visual result, the ability to see immediately what the effect is of a change in the software is really powerful because now you're no longer having to guess what happens when you make the change. It shows you the consequences. Not all programming uh, problems have visual output that uh, reflect the result of the changes though. I mean, if it's a finance system, it's not clear exactly what you would show, uh, especially a system that doesn't come to a conclusion but just keeps running forever. So Brett's, Brett's ideas, in my opinion, don't always apply to every kind of application, but he's, he uh, wants you to look for ways of getting feedback as early as possible in the programming process. And I think that theme is very important for trying to avoid making mistakes. And so having a programming environment which is conscious of the program that's being written and can extract from it um, the recognition of common mistakes, like referring to a variable that hasn't been set. If you do a conditional expression based on a variable that hasn't been set, you're gonna get a random answer and that usually is not good news. Uh, you might have done an input act and you pulled in data that overwhelms the buffer that was set for it. And so if you fail to check for how much data is coming in against the amount of buffer space that was allocated to it, you may have just introduced a buffer overflow, which is a favorite mechanism for attacking programs and getting them to execute things that were not intended. So I, programming environments, in my view, are really powerful tools. We have not done well designing those environments to help you avoid making stupid mistakes, which is where most bugs come from. Well, given the amount of time that uh, we have left, I think I should stop on the commentary, Max, and try to get to some of the questions. That's... Yeah, um, I think we could easily fill an another hour with the, the questions that are coming in. Um, uh, for fairness, Sebastian was the first one to say he's uh, waiting for 45 minutes. So let's try to keep the questions um, uh, fairly short. And Vint, if you can, also the answers. Keep the answer short. <laughs> Sebastian. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, do you think information should be free? Well, uh, this is a, uh, these are fighting words for some people, as you probably know, especially if you believe in intellectual property. Uh, and so my answer is some information should be free, especially stuff that's no longer under copyright or stuff that people want to share. 
Uh, you know, when, when I watched the World Wide Web unfold, the thing that was the most astonishing to me was the vast quantity of information that people put up on their web pages for the simple reason that they wanted other people to take advantage of what they knew. There was great satisfaction discovering somebody actually cared about what you shared without necessarily being compensated in any way. Now, since that time, that, that motivation is still there. That incentive is still there. Of course, then there's also incentive for putting things up that you want people to pay you for. So I think the tent is quite big and that we can allow for the entire range of shared information, freely shared information and information which might be uh, a, for which you have to pay a compensation. What's important though, and implicit in your question is the ability to discover the information. And so I'm a huge fan of search engines, not surprisingly, because I work at Google, but that helps people discover information that's of interest and of value to them. And so the, you should be freely able to search, even if the results of the search may uh, require you to pay in order to get access to that which was found. Thanks, Ben. I would actually uh, suggest that um, uh, you pick uh, the, the questions. There are a good number in uh, the chat as well, but um, uh, for the moment- There are uh, hundreds of them. Uh, well, let me, I, I caught one that caught my eye was on quantum computing. Cool. Uh, so and I'm, I'm not even gonna take the time to go scroll to find it. It just, it just caught my eye. Uh, let me tell you that Google is extremely interested in quantum computing. Um, and the reason is that uh, in theory, you can solve optimization problems with a quantum computer that would not be solvable in any reasonable amount of time using conventional methods, finite difference methods and things like that. And so we're very interested in the possibility that we could solve really, really hard problems in an efficient uh, way in a reasonable amount of time, maybe even in real time that we couldn't tackle otherwise. Now, I will tell you, however, that as much as you hear about quantum computing, and I'm even leaving out quantum key distribution and quantum networking, just, just the computing part, uh, we are very far away from having quantum computers to do very useful things. And so the challenge is still with us to implement these things that allow them to maintain their entangled properties long enough to actually do the computation that produces the answer because they, in getting the answer, you destroy the con quantum state. So, you know, you don't get to ask too frequently and say, did I get the answer? Or did I get the answer? You know, sort of, are we here yet? Are we here yet? And the answer is the first time you ask, that's the only time you get to ask and you have to start all over again. So uh, I'm very excited about it though. And we are making progress, but at Google, we still have a ways to go. I think we built a quantum computer with 53 qubits and another one with 72. Uh, we we uh, demonstrated a program called quantum supremacy, which is a terrible term. All we did was demonstrate that we did in a short amount of time using the quantum system that which we would have taken longer to do, but it was mostly just generating random, random numbers, not a terribly useful thing, except for certain kinds of applications that, uh, for which cryptography actually could benefit. So there's a long ways to go, but it's still worth, worth the effort. All right, so I uh, let you. I, I want to call one out, Vint, um, that is by Laura, not last to have a, a female come in with a question. Laura, do you want to unmute and ask the question that you put in chat um, uh, over the mic as well? Yeah, sure. Hello, sorry. Uh, well, I have a question that should help us here on the journey that's about to come. So, what motivated you to continue, sir? What the, when you were stuck, what pushed you forward to not give up? You know, um, that's a really good question. And it's one of those, uh, I'm, first of all, I'm optimistic by nature, uh, even though as a lot of you can tell right now, the internet is in this strange state where there's a lot of abuse that's showing up. Uh, I'm still optimistic that we will figure out how to manage that problem while we're preserving all the good things that we've seen the internet can do. Um, but I think um, that optimism is what has always sustained me I'm also not afraid to ask for help. And believe me, the internet wouldn't happen if I uh, had not had the ability and the benefit of finding people smarter than I am uh, to help solve some of the problems. And that has helped. The other one is patience and persistence. Uh, and I can't overemphasize uh, how important it has been to be patient 
about getting something to happen. The internet uh, work started in 1973 and it took us 10 years to get to the point where we could turn it on. And it took another 10 years before the World Wide Web showed up. And then another 10 or 15 years before the smartphone showed up to bind mobile technology with the internet together to be mutually reinforcing. It has taken 20 plus years to get from the beginnings of the interplanetary internet design to its implementation. Uh, which we're now starting to, to see emerging in the US with the Artemis program, but with ESA and JAXA and the Korean space agencies as well participating. So much of my work is measurable in decades. And so patience and persistence have really made a difference uh, in my view. So uh, I think uh, Winston Churchill was uh, quoted as saying, never, 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 several hundred times, never, never give up. And uh, unless it's demonstrated that it's flat out, you know, violates the second law of thermodynamics, I'm gonna keep trying. Cool, then let's take some of the folks who had their hand up for uh, quite a while. Dennis, do you want to ask the next question, please? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I have a question about quant uh, quantum computing. Do you think quantum computing or quantum computers will at any time be available for normal customers or the use of it will be in any use for a normal customer? So the answer is uh, we are optimistic. And the reason I can say that is that we've already provided programming frameworks for customers to try algorithms out. We can simulate the quantum algorithms using conventional machines. They just run very slowly, but at least you could validate whether or not the quantum algorithm uh, would produce the result that you're looking for if you could run it on a quantum machine. So the answer is yes, I believe so. Um, I am not good, a good enough physicist to tell you whether it's a five-year or a 10-year thing before we get to something that we can offer. But certainly the official position at Google uh, is that we expect that quantum computing will actually be a deliverable uh, product sometime in our future. And so we've been willing to invest in it for quite a long time. Awesome. Hendrik, please come in. Hi, um, since you've worked on bringing the internet um, to space and to Mars, what are your thoughts on um, colonizing Mars with SpaceX and like endeavors with Starlink um, to have global satellite network for the world? So uh, uh, Elon Musk and I are, uh, again, the acquaintances, I don't want to overstate it, but we exchange email now and then, particularly uh, recently on both SpaceX and its successes and also the uh, Starlink program. Um, there are others, as you may know, Web1 is, an, is another one, and I think there's one called Kuiper, uh, Kuiper which uh, comes out of uh, Bezos uh, operation. It's either part of Amazon or maybe Jeff doing his own thing. Uh, so there are several um, different uh, low Earth orbiting satellite programs. The one which is clearly most advanced, in my view anyway, is Starlink. Um, and uh, it looks to all intents and purposes as uh, being a successful operation. It has the interesting property, of course, that, uh, that SpaceX has both pieces of the equation balanced. After he gets 24,000 satellites in orbit, which is the plan, there, it will be impossible to avoid access to the internet because every square inch of the planet will be accessible. I just asked uh, just last week about the data rates that we could expect from the South Pole because uh, there are some significant scientific experiments at the South Pole. One of them is called the Ice Cube. It's looking for super powerful neutrons, uh, neutrinos coming from outside of our galaxy. Uh, and that's a perfect place to observe them uh, at the South Pole. So there's a very big National Science Foundation sponsored experiment there. They need data to go back and forth. I'm sorry, that's my phone ringing, just ignore it. Um, so anyway, the answer is that uh, 300 megabits a second may be available uh, from the SpaceX system or the Starlink system at the South Pole. So I'm a big fan of all that. The real issue here is how much does it cost uh, and is it, is it sustainable? And that raises a very interesting question. Imagine that you get 24,000 satellites up there. By the time the 24,000th one is up there, the first one will probably start falling out of the sky. But you know, Elon has that solved. He's got SpaceX to launch the next one. So he has a, a, a self-sustaining business. The satellites fall out of the sky and SpaceX sends up another rocket with another 60 satellites, done. 
So um, I'm actually pretty excited about that uh, particular um, effort. The others, uh, I hope, uh, will be as successful. But I will tell you that most of us in the networking world believe that the only way to achieve gigabit speeds delivered to the edge of the net is fiber. And since there are places where fiber is just never going to go. Uh, so, you know, there's a balance here between being able to reach something reasonably and being able to deliver fiber. Max, I Hendrik, see just to, um, Hendrik, just to give you a flavor of uh, how much Wind loves to think about um, science and the future and science fiction, he has a, a personal triple collection, which uh, you're welcome to, to Google. It's an alien race from Star Trek. And I thought maybe he could uh, show you one. <laughs> so if you want to make him happy, you get him a triple. This is my triple collection. <laughs> They're just the most awesome aliens you can imagine from the good old Star Trek when they were still beating the um, aliens up and stuff like that. Uh, Vint, if you can, we, uh, we would love to squeeze in one more question. Yes, I have time for at least uh, one or two more. So why don't we go ahead and ask the next question? Excellent. Marta, would you like to ask your question, please? Yes, sure, I do. I wanted to ask uh, how important is the networking, uh, in your opinion, for the professional and the personal growth? And so also the second part of the question, do you know, the Dennis Ritchie? I'm sorry, what was the last question? Uh, the Dennis Richer, the one who had developed the Python. I think I'm not familiar with that. So either that, or I'm not, or I'm not understanding the question. Let okay, then, then just about the no, network. Right, let me start with the first one. Um, so, well, it's it should be pretty obvious during this pandemic that networking has become pretty fundamental uh, to almost everything uh, for those people who can use the net. And of course, if you don't have access to the internet, you can't use it. And so we already see this vivid digital divide just made it all the more vivid by the absence of internet in uh, so much of the world. Internet's everywhere on the planet, but it's not uniformly distributed. And especially in rural areas, it's not. And in the developing world, it's not nearly as penetrated. So uh, the, the utility of it in the midst of all of this pandemic has simply been highlighted and that's motivated me to do everything I can to get more internet out there. I've been motivated to do that for years, but this just reinforces that. So networking uh, in the technical sense of the word, I think has turned out to be very important. I don't think we will ever go back to not working at home some of the time or not going to school from home some of the time. I know all of you presumably have been going to school online uh, because you can't get together face to face for safety's sake. So we've, we've learned both that it's very important. We've also learned that it doesn't always work very well. And so we have lots of work to do to refine our ability to uh, engage in useful online work. Uh, we have to figure out uh, how do we accommodate that? If do you have a special room at home that you can set aside to do this, most people don't. I'm lucky I have a, an office, which I'm in right now in my basement. And I've been in here for the last 11 months. Um, uh, and so it's fortunate that I can close everything off, but there are other places that, uh, you know, people whose homes don't have that capability, or maybe you're fighting with each other over the laptop, or you're fighting with each other over access to the internet and the speeds that are available, because the kids are trying to go to school and you're trying to do your work. So that kind of networking is super valuable. Personal networking is also valuable, and so I won't spend time on that, but I will say that making connections and keeping them uh, is super important for your career. Uh, all of you who now know each other as a result of being at the 42 school should side, try to stay in touch, try to stay friends, because as you get older, your friends will end up in really powerful positions, not all of them, but some of them, and it will be really great to still know them and to be able to interact with them. And so now you asked a second question that I kept having trouble understanding. You were mentioning something that I don't recognize. Maybe you should ask it a different way. It was about the, the Python uh, inventor, the, the programming oh. language. Ah, uh, okay. So Python, uh, I actually like Python. It's a very 
convenient language. You can get yourself in trouble with it, though, which is why Google ended up writing Go, which is, you know, another alternative. Uh, but I like Python a lot. Now, the guy that uh, that uh, that did it used to work for Bob Kahn, and then he and uh, uh, Guido, uh, then um, God, what's Guido's last name? Um, I'm drawing a blank. All of it. That's a senior moment. Uh, he worked also at Google uh, for a while before he went on to other things. So a very smart guy, uh, nice piece of work. Excellent. So um, uh, we have a, a couple of um, uh, students who are waiting patiently. Sergio, you uh, put up your hand very early. Please ask your question. Yes, thank you. Um, what do you think the internet will be like in 100 years? Will it be more open or more limited? What do you think about the dark web? Uh, is it beneficial or dangerous? And at last, uh, how do you think will the internet change through interference of nations and politics? <laughs> so tell me, uh, yeah, yeah, and you want the answer in 25 words or less and give, yeah. and give examples, right? So look, 100 years is a long time. Uh, I don't have any idea. There will be something which might even still be called internet in 100 years. Uh, and it will be a massive uh, communications capability. Everything will have access to it. You won't even think about it. It'll be like electricity coming out of the wall and air. Now, if so it will be um, widely available. Now, having said that, I haven't said anything about whether or not access to it will be controlled, filtered, uh, you know, whether there will be a fragmented internet where something in one part of the world can't communicate with something else. We're already starting to see that fragmentation happen. It's being driven by uh, policies adopted by countries who are thinking in the Westphalian way that they have this sovereignty in a physical area and they should have sovereignty in cyberspace. You hear this term data sovereignty, which is derived exactly out of this sort of thinking. The trouble is the internet was not designed with that in mind. It was designed to be non-national in character. It was intended to be uh, uniformly accessible no matter where you were. It was intended to offer exactly the same results on a DNS lookup no matter where you are on the internet. It was intended to be transparent. And uh, of course, the problem is that reality strikes and we, uh, we get applications in this layered architecture uh, that support activity that some countries object to. You know, some of them will say, well, the following content is awful and we should block it or filter it out. And, and in many cases, a lot of countries would agree with that, child pornography being a classic example of that. On the other hand, uh, some country might say, we don't like it when our citizens criticize the government. We consider that to be bad information and they wanna block that. And there are other countries who, who say that no, that freedom of speech is important. In fact, the, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights emphasizes that and I'm a big fan of that. So the answer is that it is, we are in the middle of a turmoil right now over these issues. And I hope, frankly, a hundred years from now, we will have come to some conclusion, hopefully before that, about how to provide tools to deal with abusive behaviors sufficiently well that we can keep the network as open as possible. Uh, but whether we achieve that objective remains to be seen. It's gonna require cooperation on an international basis to achieve that objective because people who are doing harmful things on the net can have victims in other jurisdictions. So there's a whole organization called Internet and Jurisdiction, which uh, is run by uh, one, a friend of mine, Bernard de, de la Chapelle out of Paris, which is focused on that. And Max, as uh, some of you may know, has been very much involved in Internet policy for well over a decade and continues to contribute to that. So it's a hard problem. I would argue, Max, that this should be assigned as a project for the students to think their way through what is the internet, what do you want the internet to look like in 100 years and how do you achieve that objective? Sounds like a really awesome project. I'd be more than happy to join a group of you to <clears throat> think this through and maybe we can get some feedback from Vint along the way as we're uh, developing the dream internet. I'd actually pointed to the internet jurisdiction network while you spoke so um, yeah, more than happy to, to discuss and uh, help out. Maybe one last one. Um, uh, Sarush had his hand up from the very beginning. So thanks for waiting, Sarush. 
Thank you. First of all, I wanted to say thank you, sir. Uh, we all were very excited for that meeting and also thank you for inventing the internet. Um, so my question is, um, was there any point back in the 70s so where you notice or uh, could you imagine that this project will be so big as it is today and that it will change the world and make the world a better place and an easier place? So without your invention, we wouldn't sit, in, we wouldn't sit here and uh, we couldn't do our, uh, we couldn't learn online. So this is my question. Could you, could you imagine sure. that it's, before? It's a very good question. Thank you for that. First of all, I, every one of you should recognize that I'm not the only inventor. Uh, my partner, Robert Kahn and I did the original work, two hands on one pencil. And then we, we, we designed this with the, with the intent of allowing for lots of contributions to come from other people. Uh, we layered the architecture based on lessons we learned on the uh, ARPANET project. Uh, we adopted some of the protocols from that project into the internet, making the appropriate transformations. Uh, we allowed in this architecture for new, uh, new protocols horizontally across any particular layer. We allowed new technology to be swept in for transmission, for example. When we did this original design, there was no fiber optics available. And yet we, we, were, we deliberately designed the internet layer of protocol so it didn't know anything about how the packets were being carried. So that if a new carrying method came along, we would just plop the internet down on top of it. And we also designed the internet layer so the packets didn't know what they were carrying. They all I knew is a little bag of bits. And that meant that the only thing that knew what the bits meant was at the edges of the net. So if you invented a new application, the internet didn't change. We, we did that on purpose. Uh, I remember it was being designed as part of a command and control system for the Defense Department in the United States. We, we knew that it needed to, it needed to be available to uh, all of the allies Uh, who might be uh, working with the US. And so, and since we couldn't know who the allies were going to be in the future, we released the design publicly. And, and that was, and some people said, how could you do that in the middle of the Cold War? And the answer is we didn't ask for permission, we just did it and nobody noticed. So, uh, so we got away with that. I don't know if we get away with that now. Uh, we come back to your primary question, you know, when did I know that this was going to be a big deal? Uh, it, It, it sort of uh, slowly dawned on me um, as, as we built more and more internet and it continued to work and new applications came along, you begin to realize that this, this is a technology which is ready to support a lot of new ideas, new applications. Oh, and by the way, the data rates kept going up, which enabled new things. But I should tell you that even in the, in the late 1970s, as we were just literally beginning to experiment with this stuff, we were experimenting with digitized voice and video. We were planning video conference capability. We were planning, you know, voice video and data. Uh, we were, um, and so what we're doing today is what we were hoping we could do before. It's just that we couldn't do very much of it because the data rates were low. The background, or background the backbone uh, data rate on the ARPANET was 50 kilobits a second. That's, you can get that with a modem today, but 50 kilobits was high speed in 1969. So um, we, we were anticipating a lot of those kinds of applications, partly because they would be required in the command and control context. It, there is one moment in this whole uh, story where I realized that this was going to be a big deal and that I should be taking some actions as a result. It's 1988. In 1984, Cisco Systems started manufacturing routers uh, to sell to the academic community. And the reason that they recognized there was a market is that the way you built a router before that was to find a computer and a graduate student and you wrap the graduate student around the computer and you turned it into a router. And then we ran out of graduate students. So uh, Cisco started selling routers and then Juniper came along later and there were several others. Uh, so in 1988, I walked into an, an exhibition called Interop, which stood for interoperability. It had been going for a couple of years. 
it got started by a friend of mine, Dan Lynch. And in the first year in 80, 86, it was just a few hundred people showed up and we just briefed them on what the internet was all about. By 1988, 50,000 people showed up in the Moscone Center in San Francisco. And there was an exhibition of, you know, certainly scores of companies showing their products and services. So I walk in with Eric Benamo, who is the, at that time was the president of 3Com, which stood for Computers, Communications and Com Compatibility and had been started by Bob Metcalf, the inventor of the ethernet. So Benamu and I walk in and the first thing we see is a two story tall Cisco display. And it, it's, I mean, it's physically huge and there's little rooms inside and there's stairways. I mean, it's a big piece of equipment. So I turned to Eric Benamu and I said, Eric, how much does this cost? And he said, a quarter of a million dollars. This was back in 1988 when a quarter of a million dollars was a lot of money. And he said, and that doesn't count the cost of manning the thing, you know, for the week. And I just stood there with my jaw dropping, thinking, my God, people think they're going to make money out of this. And, and then I thought, okay, how in the hell are we going to get this into the hands of the general public? And at that time, this thing has been running now for five years, but the government uh, supporters of it, the Department of Energy, NASA, and NSF, and DARPA, uh, did not permit any commercial traffic to go on the backbones that they had built. And so I'm sitting here thinking, well, the only way that, that this will ever get into the hands of the general public is if we allow commercialization. So I'm trying to figure out how do I break the rule that says no commercial traffic on the government backbones? Well, I had built something called MCI Mail for MCI a few years before in 1983. And, uh, and so I said, well, let me ask permission to test the MCI Mail commercial email service and to see if it will uh, interact you know, successfully with the internet, which would require breaking of this appropriate use policy. And much to my surprise, they said, well, okay, you can do that for a year as an experiment. So in 89, I announced that we had now connected this commercial email system to the internet, which meant anybody on MCI Mail could talk to anybody on the internet. And as soon as we announced that, all the other commercial email services, telemail and on time and so on, said, well, wait a minute, you know, these guys can't have this privileged position. We want to be hooked up too. And of course, they were all walled gardens before they were interconnected to the internet. But when they got connected to the internet, suddenly everybody in every walled garden could talk to everybody else to go through the internet. And oh, by the way, commercial traffic is flowing, which convinces the private sector there's a business in internet service. And so in late 89, three commercial internet services pop up, UUNet, PSINet, and SurfNet. And so in 1989, we see this sudden breaking of the appropriate use barrier and then two years later, Tim Berners-Lee announces the World Wide Web. Nobody notices except for Mark Andreessen and Eric Bina at the National Center for Supercomputer Applications. And they invent the Mosaic browser, which produces a graphical user interface, which gets um, the guy who founded uh, Silicon Graphics all excited. And he takes Mark Andreessen and Eric ben, uh, Bina and others to the West Coast to start Netscape Communications in 1994 they have an initial public offering in 1995, the stock goes through the roof and the dot boom is on. And at this point, Silicon Valley is throwing money at anything that looks like it has something to do with the internet. That goes on until April of 2000, at which point a lot of the startups go out of business because they didn't have any income, they just had capital and the guys who were running it didn't understand the difference between finite amounts of capital and continued revenue. So there were a bunch of dead bodies around in the internet space, but the internet kept growing. And of course, Google came along in 1998, survived the dot bust uh, and thrives uh, today. So, uh, there's, so a lot, there's more to the story, but I have to stop. Yeah, nobody can ask for more of it. You gave us a condensed version, the, the history of the internet in a nutshell. 
Thank you so much. I think um, uh, this is the moment where um, uh, you know we could go on and on and on, and I hope we get the chance to have another chat sometime with you. Um, maybe one day welcome you in Wolfsburg. It's actually a really nice space that we're putting together here. You would love the the Fab Lab and you know the the 3D printing and the the you know making the internet um, a physical thing. Um, Vint and I worked for more than four years on inter, uh, IoT interoperability, which turned out to be a very difficult task as well. But uh, we're still on it. Maybe we make the, the automobiles and uh, other vehicles start to interoperate a bit more. Many good causes. And I hope that um, uh, the students, that you all uh, got a taste for the awesomeness of this open approach and of the open standards way of thinking that uh, Vint represents very, very vividly and charmingly. Vint, thank you so much for your time and um, hope to see you in 3D very soon again. Well, you know where to go. You need to arm wrestle with my chief of staff, Carla, and we'll try to find some more time to do this uh, again, and I'll try to answer more questions. Awesome. Thanks, Vin. Right. Have a wonderful care, everybody. Day. Have a great week. Bye-bye for Bye. now.